Well, we're beginning a, a new series here, a series on Moses, and I'm really excited about it because I think one of the things that we have as an advantage as believers is that we get to learn from the lives of people who are fully exposed, both their strengths, their weaknesses, their victories, and their failures. I meet so many people who say, I wish I had a mentor, somebody that really knew me, that could walk with me and like kind of celebrate when I'm doing well and guide me when I'm doing poorly. And I think by God's grace, many of us will have a mentor and will be a mentee to somebody But for the most part, most of us, when we're going through life, our mentors will be the scriptures. And we'll have to look at the lives of people. And by God's grace, he's actually given us people who he fully exposed. And in fact, some of our mentors won't be as vulnerable as the scriptures will be with us. So by God's grace, we have Moses. And we're going to look at the life of Moses. We're going to track with him for the next few weeks and and watch all of his victories, all of his failures, and then we'll learn from them. And so the key is not just to get educated, but to be transformed. So I pray that you would use this almost like the Proverbs. And there'll be points in here that'll feel like the Proverbs, that we have these great pithy statements, hopefully, that will lean on us and we can be like him. So let Moses be your mentor. Now, we won't go too much into the detail of how he was born. Uh, We will uh, go and do that in a few weeks, but we'll look at kind of the center of his life, kind of the pinnacle moment of his calling. So if you have your Bibles, uh, feel free to turn to uh, Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. It says, now in, in verse 11 and 12, Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that. And when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Now, it's kind of a crazy moment, right, because the way that Moses grew up was that he was actually a Hebrew kid, but he was being raised as an Egyptian kid, and he was being raised by the leader of the Egyptians, Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh had adopted him to the point where Pharaoh was his grandfather. So he was living in this prestigious palace as an Egyptian, but he was really a Hebrew and, and, and the Hebrew people had been enslaved for hundreds of years. And there is Moses. And he's seen so much oppression happening to the Jewish people. And he himself, a Jew, he got fed up one day. And so what the scripture tells us is that one day, Moses decides to come out of his palace as he looks down and he sees an Egyptian beating up one of his brothers, one of his companions. And what he decides to do is he decides to hit the Egyptian dude, and he hits him so hard that he kills him. He he had looked around, and he made sure the scene was set so that the only person that would know that the Egyptian was dead would be his Hebrew homeboy. So it's going to be quiet. No one's going to know about it. It's a secret. It's on the down low. I killed this dude. Everything is done. But then it says, um, he went out the next day. And behold, two Hebrews were fighting each other in verses 13 through 15. Two Hebrews are now fighting each other. And he said to the offender, so this is the guy that's really getting his licks in. He says to the offender, why are you striking your companion?" Why, why, you both are Hebrews. I mean, why would you even be fighting? This is a noble thing. I mean, the first thing he does is he stops Egyptians from killing Hebrews or fighting a Hebrew. And then he sees two Hebrews fighting. And he's like, guys, come on. We're all one. We're together. We should be working on unity. And look what he says. He says, uh, are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian?" And I'm sure Moses was like, how do you know that? 
Like I thought that was all quiet. Like I totally helped that guy out. And how did that get out? So here Moses is shocked, surprised. Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Moses wanted to do a good thing. He wanted to bring unity amongst the Hebrew people. He wanted to stop the oppression of Hebrew people. And yet, there are some things that we can learn from Moses' life about believing your call to a great work and yet having to make sure the context is right, making sure that people understand what you're trying to do. And so let's look real quick at some background regarding Moses. It says in Acts chapter 7, verse 23, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. So what happened was, you know, I'm, I'm 41, praise the Lord. And, you know, you get there, are some, and I don't know if you know this, but there comes an age when you feel like you should have accomplished something, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and 40 for him was like his age. Now, you got to understand this dude had been raised in the palace his whole life. They had been slaves 400 years. This wasn't the first time he peeked out the palace and saw Hebrews fighting Hebrews and Egyptians fighting Hebrews. This wasn't the first time, but it was a time in his mind to say, this is it. This is my time. I, I feel God is calling me to do this, and I'm not going to take it anymore. So he decides, it's my time time. Yeah. This is the time I'm going to have my platform. This is the time people are going to see my gifting. This is the moment people are going to see my skills. I'm going to put on display everything God has made me to do and every conviction I have in my soul. This is my time. And yet, there's some critical errors we can see from Moses. In Acts chapter 7, verse 22, and this is so very important, it says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Now that phrase, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, that was actually a colloquialism, meaning that was a phrase like um, if we were to say, that guy has it all together. That's what that phrase was when someone would say, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And so people were saying that, that, that Moses was a very intelligent man, and he was very profound. Now, Moses, having been raised in Pharaoh's home, would have actually gone to a university. It was called the Temple of the Sun, and that was considered the Harvard or the Oxford of their day. And he would have studied the sciences and medicine and astronomy and chemistry and theology, philosophy, and law. In addition to that, though, he would have studied military uh, science. There was, an, in a sense, an ROTC. And from what Josephus says, who's a biblical scholar, he says he had already led an army in war. In fact, they had beaten the Ethiopians in battle. And so Moses was not only skilled, it says he was profound in his words and profound in action, but he was studied, he was smart, and he'd already led battles and, and brilliant military strategy. But above all this, above all the fact that he was well studied, that he had great speech, that he was wise and sharp, the Bible said he looked good too, praise God, the Bible didn't leave that out. <laughs> Despite all that, here's, here's what, every day he saw his grandfather Pharaoh's leadership. He saw how Pharaoh would say, go that way, and people would. He saw how Pharaoh would tell people how to move, and they would move to jump, and they'd say, how high? He always saw his granddaddy, Pharaoh, working. And so Moses, as we understand, was being nurtured for the throne of Pharaoh. And so here's the critical error from Moses. In Acts 7, verse 25, it says, Moses assumed his people would understand that God 
gave him the deliverance through him. But they didn't understand. Moses was like, yo, y'all see this? I'm going to walk. This is what's going to happen, right? I'm a, I got my education, okay? And I'm going to just show up into town. And when I show them all my skill sets and how powerfully wise and skillful I am, everybody's going to be so blown away. They're going to be like, oh, my gosh, we've never heard anything like this. And they're going to be so perplexed that they're going to follow me and follow my leadership because I'm so skilled. People are going to be blown away by me. And so he assumed that people would understand the passion that he had and the skills that he had. And they would follow him. You know, some of you have a unique dream that God has given you. Some of you have these incredible convictions that God has given you, whether it be a business, whether it be your, your talent level in terms of song, whether it be uh, teaching or education. Some of you have incredible skill. And your skill set means people will have to follow you in this skill set, whatever it is. And what we can see from Moses in his leadership is that Moses had godly motives, but he operated with Pharaoh's methods. You see? You see, many people don't see that, uh, they don't see godly success because they're reading about Jesus, but they're mimicking the world. And so what tends to happen is they're very clear about the dreams that God gave them, but they're very unclear about who they should watch. And what that teaches us is that we ought to be careful about who we're watching. We ought to be careful about the models that we have, the people that we see. And that no matter how pure your motive is, no matter how wise you may presume yourself to be, there could be a chance that your style can be corrupted. Another thing that we learn. When God's in it, it flows, but when the flesh is in it, it's forced. You see, it's amazing how I meet so many people and they really do believe God wants me to do something, but they want me to, in, they want to intimidate me to follow what they just said. You are not going to intimidate people into righteousness. Or, you know, you know understand this. When you, when, when you believe God is calling you to do something and you're meeting resistance, the key is to go back and pray and re-strategize and seek God, but it is not the flesh. It is not the flesh. And far too often, we go and we get old habits and we know it's worked in the past and we try to conjure up a way where we're going to force people to do what we feel like we were given by God. And then we'll, 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 we'll put a little God told me so on it. That means people have to do it now because God told you. Well, he needs to tell me too, praise God. That's actually one of my points, so clap again when I say that. Um, praise the Lord. Um, in fact, that's my next point. Um, it doesn't matter if God convinced your heart, you still need to convince my mind. If God convicted your heart, you still need to convince people. Listen, church, if, it does not matter how pure the motive is, how godly the intention is, how great. If you want to start adoption for kids in, 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 in Russia or whatever, you want to do something great, you want to help. I mean, it's a godly motive. You're still going to have to persuade people. And if you don't have the gift of persuasion, then you will never be truly a leader in God's design. It must be convic you must be convicted in your heart, but you must convince the minds of men and women. It says of Jesus that he grew in wisdom and stature, but it also says he grew in favor with God and man means that you not only need to sit and pray and strategize about what God is saying, but you need to learn how to become favorable in the eyes of men. Whoever told you it doesn't matter what people think lied to you. It matters what people think, particularly if you want to lead people. I don't know what, how we conjured up this idea. I'm going to lead people simultaneously. It doesn't matter what they think. I don't know, I don't know if that's working for you. Praise God. 
but it generally doesn't work, all right? So we must be able to grow in favor with men, understanding what are the things that they need, what are the things that they see, and when they don't understand me, I must work harder for them to understand me. It's not they fall. And that's exactly what happened here. Moses came out of that palace, and he was like, y'all should follow me. And they were like, who are you? I'm, I'm going to be the next in line. I don't know that. I just know you're Pharaoh's grandson. And, I, and the one thing I know is that you're not Pharaoh. So, another thought. Too often, when people see themselves as great, they're looking at their gifting. But when God sees you as great, he's looking at your humility. Okay? And so people will see and they'll look in the mirror and they'll be like, it's my time. I think I'm special. I think I have something great God wants me to do. But the, it is not about your skill. It is your submission to the Holy Spirit. It is your ability to hear from God and hear from people. It is that kind of humility that God uses. And so these little lessons that we're able to see, Moses had to learn that. Moses had to hear from God. And so... Um, Moses had to go to a different school. He had to go to a school of humility. And he ends up going to Midian and learning about a different science. He had to really uneducate himself and unlearn. And now he would be, end up being a shepherd. And you know how long he was out in Midian? 40 years. 40 years. And so for 40 years, here is Moses out as a shepherd boy now. And so what we'll learn later is that he, he had punted his dream, lost his confidence. He didn't really believe in himself anymore. And now here he is just with sheep. But he once had a dream. He had a real big belief about himself. He thought he was going to make a change in the city that he lived in. He thought God had set him apart to do something great. And he punted that because he started defining himself by his failure. He no longer saw that dream. And so, um, real quick, and, and this is for free, this is a commercial break, um, don't miss that it took 40 years for him to unlearn. Be very careful of completely seeing success as a quick thing. Oftentimes, success is a long journey of faithfulness in the same direction. Very few people see success in year one, two, three, four, five. It generally takes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And if you would begin to reconstruct success, not by single digits, but by double digits, by 10 and 20, then you'll become more patient and you can wait on God to do some great things in your life and through you. But be very careful of presuming things will happen quick. I know you see, we see people all the time who are more connected than we've ever been. And that's a blessing and a curse. We scroll our timelines and we see that one person that's successful and got successful very quick. And that is a blessing. But what God did in their life and what it took for them to become a success does not mean it's going to work for you. And you're not even sure you want what they want, what they got. Because you really don't know what it takes behind the scenes. Be very careful of wanting to carbon copy another man or woman's success. Because you don't know what that success is like when, get, when they get out of that timeline and they go back to their house. That was for free. Then it says, Exodus chapter 3. Now, when the Lord uh, saw that God, when the Lord saw that God, oh, when, I'm sorry, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called, I'm sorry, I miss. Meanwhile, sorry, I jumped, uh, slide 12. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock 
of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was set on fire but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? Now, I just want you to notice this. Moses didn't say, why is the bush burning? Because in the desert, bushes, or is that the plural word, bushes, bushai? Bush, <laughs> lots of bu bushes. When a bush would burn up, that was a normal thing. A, a bush would spontaneously combust all the time, almost like rain. Because, because they were in the desert, they would get brittle and dry, and so they would burn up all the time. So what he was shocked by wasn't the fact that the bush was burning. He was surprised that it didn't get consumed. Why isn't it falling apart? Why isn't that bush disintegrating? And so when the Lord saw that he had gone over, Moses had gone over to look at this bush, God called to him from the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he says, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer. In fact, God would say, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he continued, I am the God of, the, uh, of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was too afraid to look at God. And what God was doing in this moment is powerful because immediately what he was telling him was that the reason why this bush is burning, and its burning has not stopped, is because I'm here. It is my presence. In fact, my presence is actually consuming this entire area that I am. So take your shoes off, because the place that you are is set apart. That's what this idea of holy is. And so holiness is not based upon a building or people. Holiness is where God's presence is. And he says, in fact, Moses, I've consumed this whole area. I, I want to show you that um, in, in, in the Old Testament, when you had your house and someone walked into your house, you would take off your shoes. So what God was saying is, you see, I've showed up. This is my house now. Take your shoes off. You're in my presence. I've turned this whole mountain into my house. This bush is my bush, and this ground is my ground. Be careful. You're in my presence. That's what Moses is saying, or what he's saying to Moses. And so then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings. Notice he says, I have observed. He says, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So because the Israelites' cry for help has come to who? Me, and I have also seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go, because I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israel, out of Egypt. Now watch this. What God is saying is, I have completely noticed everything going on. I've been listening to my people hundreds of years. And here's what I want you to know, Moses. It's my time. It's, it's my time. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready now. Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Remember, remember about 40 years ago when you said it was your time? Figured out it wasn't, right? It's my time. And see, what happens is, is that God will see a need on earth. 
And in addition to that, he will wait for the right time because he is sovereign and he has a plan that is expanding beyond you and beyond your passions and beyond your skill sets. And then he sends the right servant to meet that need. He sees a need, he waits for the right time, and he sends a servant to that need. And it's on his time. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, the eyes of the Lord roam through the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. And oftentimes, the reason why God is letting us go through all those trials, the reason why you are continually feeling overlooked and looked around, the reason why other people are having different opportunities go for them, isn't because God doesn't like you or doesn't want to use you. It's just not his time. And he will use you in his time so that you could actually believe that you are ready for something, but the situation is not ready for you. And so what's happening is God is setting things up, not for your success, but for his success. And so, yes, he could be setting things up, but he could also be bringing you down. He could be humbling your heart. He could be purifying your motives. He could have you in a desert place, just with a sheep, just out there by Mount Horeb, just so that you won't think too highly of yourself. But why a bush? I mean, couldn't God just have gone without all the bush antics? Are you just trying to show off, Lord? Couldn't he have gone without the whole take your sandals off? Oftentimes, now, God would say that you will see success and people will come back and they'll worship at this mountain. So he wants the mountain to be a symbol of success to them, something that he can keep in his mind. But the bush... Why did he use that bush? Well, if you look in the scriptures, oftentimes God will use agriculture as a means of creating imagery and memory. He'll talk about trees planted by the water so that we can see them. But but here, he uses a bush. Now, far too often people believe that God will use me when I get it all together. Let me just say that again. When I get myself together, God will use me. And what you see yourself is as a tree filled with all this fruit. And God's going to pick off some of that fruit and be like, oh, this is nice. I'm ready to use you now because you have it all together finally. And sometimes the imagery of trees, we may forget that the point of God using a tree is to say he's going to produce the work through you. It's not that you're going to produce the work through yourself. But maybe he uses this bush. Because the reason why a bush burns up is not because it's bountiful, but because it's dried up. It's because it's brittle. It's because it's so weak. And Maybe you need to stop asking, am I bountiful? And maybe ask yourself, am I burnable? Yeah. Am I, am I weak enough to come before the Lord with all my weaknesses? Do I saturate myself in prayer? In other words, do I believe he is my power and he is my strength? You see, really, a bush that would burn was really dead, And it was ready to be lit on fire. And so when when something would burn up, it was really dying. And the Bible calls us to die to self. And that's why in Romans it would say that we are a living sacrifice, that we are dying daily, and that the people God burns and lights on fire, the people that God puts on display, is not the people that are so bountiful. It's the people that are burnable. The people that he can light on fire. People that have realized that they are not adequate in and of themselves. But their power is from on high. And so, Moses would eventually ask God, who am I? I mean, have you, have you, did you see that dead? You, I killed somebody, right? Let's not, let's not run past the fact this is a murderer. 
So the minute you disqual, unless you've killed somebody, which we may have that here, praise God, but unless you've killed somebody, you shouldn't be at the place where you say, man, I'm disqualified. And even if you have killed someone, you can see God uses a murderer for his glory. And so he says here, Mo- Moses asked, who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and that I, I, me, should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he answered, I will certainly be with you. And this will be the sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt and you will worship at this mountain. And then Moses asked God, got another question for you, Lord. If I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers, blah, 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 you know, the thing you told me, what if they ask me what's his name? What should I tell them? Now, this was a very important point. Now, I want you to notice, though, the first thing he asks, God, you want me to do something great. Have you seen me? So he is completely under the belief that God will only use me based upon my resume. But he says, but in addition to that, not only who am I to be used, but who are you in the first place? I mean, when they begin to doubt and question, and I start telling about Abraham, they don't know those people. You see, you have to understand, in the Egyptian economy, every god that they had had a specialty. Each deity had something that they would be described by, and it displayed their power. So Osiris was the king of the living. Anubis was the divine embalmer, the one that would have you when you were dead. Ra was the god of the sun and radiance. Horus, god of vengeance. Thoth, god of knowledge and wisdom. Hathor, goddess of motherhood. And, and when you said their name, it would be indicative of their power. So he was like, what's your name? Because all these other gods have names. And when I say their name, I'm not telling them who they're the god of. I need to know your name because I don't want to look like a fool in front of them. So can you give me your name? Because I... Your name will be your reputation. So what should I tell them you're about? And so God replied to him. And this is so funny, this exchange. God replied to him, I am who I am. Now, notice Moses doesn't say nothing in response. Moses is like, what? He says, This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And then it says, God also said. In other words, Moses still hadn't said nothing. God also says to Moses, say this to the Israelites. The Lord, the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I'm to be remembered in every generation. So to pause real quick, notice how even there God is contextualizing himself for different audiences. He says, if you're going to talk to Jewish people, talk about Moses and Abraham, all of this. But if you're going to talk to these people that are foreigners, tell them something that they can relate to. So just notice real quick, you can't say everything to everyone in the same way. Way. You have to understand where they are. That's a whole other sermon for another day. But God replies to him, and, he, and he's taking this in, and he can't believe what he's saying. I am who I am. Now, when you probe and you look at the original language, you'll understand that I am who I am is essentially spelling out Yahweh. And it is this idea that you are the only self-existent and infinite being in all of the universe. But if you were to look at the words and their meaning, it, it has this repetition. And it's saying that I am, it suggests the idea of uninterrupted continuous, continuance. It's this idea that I am what in creativity, creative activity I actually turn out to be in function. In other words, he's saying, I am the God that really acts. I, I am who I said I am. I, I'm the God who will reveal himself and I'll actually act through history. Another way would say, I will be what I will be. Another way to say it is, I am the existing one. But what he is saying is, I'm the God that can do all that stuff. I'm not limited to the Son. I'm not limited to embalming. I am the God that puts his uh, hand to the plow and I do what I'll say I'll do. And they had never heard of a God like that. 
a God with unlimited power. Tell them I am who I am is sending you. Well, it says Moses answered, what if they, don't, if they won't believe me and will not obey me, but say the Lord did not appear to you? And the Lord asked him, what's in your hand? And he says, a staff. And he replied, throw it on the ground. And he said, uh, as he said, so Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake and he ran from it. And the Lord told Moses, stretch out your hand and grab it by the tail. And so he stretched out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand. And this will take place, he continued, so that he will believe So they will believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. What happens here is very powerful. This defeated shepherd, this man who once dreamed that he was going to free his people, has now actually heard from the Lord, I will now Have you free your people? But all that military intelligence is not the primary thing I'm going to use. All that temple of the sun stuff is not the primary thing I'm going to use. Do you see what's in your hand? And his hand was a staff of a shepherd. Do you remember all those years that you thought were wasted while you were out there shepherding sheep? You know, all those years you thought you're just out there just going through the motions, tapping sheep, telling them go left and right. Do you remember that? I was still watching you. I was still waiting for you. I was still constructing things in your life. And so that that shepherd that you've been, that staff in your hand, I'm going to use that too. Church. If I could just pause before we close and just preach to you. Because I truly believe, I believe this about everybody in this room, everyone in this room, that God has set you apart to do something great, to do something special. And your failures will distract you. And the fact that God's timing is different than yours will distract you. And your times that you are there tending sheep will distract you. Because the sheep tending is moments of insignificance behind the scenes where no one sees you, where no one knows you. And church, God created you. None of you are a mistake. None of you are happenstance. None of you just showed up and God was surprised by you. God constructed and designed you to be who you are and he constructed trials to humiliate you at times. He's created your gifting. But there will be seasons where you must wait on the timing of the Lord, and while you are waiting, you must grow deeper in your affection and your love of God and allow him to be your source and your strength. And 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 would say, it is not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of the new covenant. And so God is our adequacy, not my resume, not my skills, not my gifting, not my background, not where my parents are from or where they're not from, not the child. None of those things make me adequate. It is the fact that I showed up and God is burning my life. I took my sandals off and I'm amongst the holiness of God. His presence makes me powerful. My adequacy is from the Lord. And no matter how much people celebrate me, and no matter how many things my parents told me, I am going to get all my strength, my affection, and my identity from Christ and Christ alone. And so what does that mean? It doesn't matter what vocation you choose. 
It doesn't matter if the first thing you tried failed. It doesn't matter if you go left, if you go right. It's who you're going with that matters. And so what he says is, what's in your hand? And, he, and I bet you in his mind, he's saying, oh, well, you know, my resume's in my hand. You know what? But Temple of the Sun is in my hand. No, 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 no. What's in your hand? Well, it's just this stupid little staff. Hey, you know, it's just this little thing I've been working on. Don't even talk about that. Don't you want something else? Don't you want something special, God? And God turns this staff into a miracle. And he uses this staff for his glory. And so what that means for us is whatever you use, whatever you surrender for God becomes his property. And so when you say, I'm going to surrender my voice to you, God, your voice becomes God's voice. When you say, I'm going to surrender my home to you, God, I want to be hospitable and have people over, that means your home becomes God's address. When you surrender your business to God, that becomes God's business. That becomes his vocation. And so what is it that God has you doing? You say, well, I don't know. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm trying to figure it out. But no, I'm saying, Monday, what are you doing? I'm just going to this little old job. That's God's job then. That's your assignment. And so whether you are shepherding sheep and you feel that you have become insignificant, the significance of your ministry is not the platform. It's not your resume. It's not how many eyes see you. The significance is in the presence of God. And when he touches a staff, it turns around. When he touches a bush, it turns to the ground. When he touches a ground, he turns around. And so if you're a teacher, you ask God, touch this classroom. If you're a singer, you say, God, touch my voice and touch these people. But whatever you're doing, whatever is in your hand, give it to him. What's in your hand? Don't wait for your significant ministry. Start tomorrow. Significance is based upon, upon God's presence, not the size of the platform. Okay, y'all weren't feeling that. Significance is based upon God's presence, not the size of your platform. You may never get that blue check next to your name on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, and yet God still verifies you. Your adequacy, that's what he's saying. I, had, I felt like I had to give a real analogy. You are, our verification comes from the Lord. Our blue check is the cross, and we are adequate in him. And it doesn't matter how many likes or retweets or shares that we have. We are significant when we give our vocation to him, not by the number of eyes on it. Holy Spirit, we ask you right now in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, God, we pray that we would lay down all of our burdens at your feet. We lay down down all of our trials at your feet, but we'd also lay down what you have us working on. Let us find our significance in you. Let us find our significance in your presence and your power. And God, we are burdened to know you more. Change our city. We want to see things change. But God, we'll wait for your time. In Jesus' name we pray.